He's led multiple preeclampsia biomarker studies in the United States and Colombia um, in South America, and he has over 50 publications in peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Berwick is a full-time clinician and consults regularly on high-risk pregnancies with a special interest in preeclampsia, HELP syndrome, and blood and kidney disorders in pregnancy. He is a sought-out and highly regarded speaker, both nationally and internationally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Natasha, for that wonderful introduction. And um, it's also a pleasure to speak, of course, here at my home institution. Weird always to do it virtually at my own institution, but always a pleasure. And my favorite topic on complement in, in preeclampsia and HELP syndrome, uh, which many of you have heard me talk about. I've given this talk multiple times, but um, it's been a couple of years. So hopefully at least I figure at least half the residents and, and half the fellows haven't, haven't heard it yet. So it's a, a, a pleasure. And, um, you know, I wasn't sure. Oh, let me get this. I wasn't sure if we had Mako since today, but you know, I always think um, this is my mom and, and my brother and I um, uh, about 20 years ago. Okay, actually about 40 years ago. But um, you know, I, I love the personal statements. I was gonna say, I always like to share a little personal. I haven't actually done this before, but share a little personal story because I love these personal statements, you know, when you see them from the medical students. So it always makes you think about that and, and what we've all had to go through and everybody has their own story. My mom had to, uh, um, uh, you know, a difficult childhood. She grew up poor and she actually um, dropped out of high school and, and ran away from home when she was 16 and then um, got pregnant at 18. And uh, she had two little uh, boys pictured here. Interestingly, she developed severe preeclampsia and she grew up in Lawndale, California, and then ended up uh, getting sent to Torrance Memorial uh, and uh, at the hospital had an eclamptic seizure and then had to have an emergency C-section at about 36 weeks. So they say OBs always have an interest in um, uh, OB history, and that's true in my case. Luckily, we all turned out well. Uh, you know, so uh, my mom is alive and well. Um, you know, she raised us as a single parent, and we both turned out to be doctors. So I think, um, you know, when I see these personal stories, of it's really, you know, you can over, everybody has comes from unique places and, and unique stories, but it inspires us all to kind of keep, keep pushing. And so here I am talking about preeclampsia. And not only that, but I have a conflict to disclose that I'm actually paid often to talk about preeclampsia and I'm paid to do research on preeclampsia. So that's actually pretty amazing to me, uh, but I don't have any conflicts to this uh, talk and Natasha has reviewed to make sure that I'm staying within the boundaries and avoiding conflicts. So, you know, I want to talk, you guys know about preeclampsia and HELP syndrome, uh, just kind of what got a case of what got me interested in this area as a fellow. And then what is, you know, a lot of people say, well, what is complement? We're, we know a lot about more about it now, but we didn't know that much 10 years ago, uh, at least in regards to preeclampsia. And then what happens in normal pregnancy? And then what do I think goes wrong in, in preeclampsia and HELP syndrome? And then, um, like mentioned on the intro, uh, uh, I'm interested in atypical HUS because there's a lot of overlap between the, uh, the, the phenotypes of HUS and HELP syndrome are very similar. And the pathophysiology may be, and then that may have implications for treatment as well. So, you know, the definition has changed. Uh, most uh, of you now, residents and even fellows, grew up with the modern definition, really, which changed in 2013. But before 2013, for 50 years or more, it was hypertension proteinuria, right? That was, you had to have proteinuria to preclamps it. And a lot, because of that, a lot of the research was done by nephrologists because it was considered uh, in part a kidney disease. And then um, it's morphed over time to hypertension and, and, and organ injury. So now we have hypertension plus um, and organ injury it could be laboratory findings or clinical signs and symptoms. And now a lot of preeclampsia is just severe hypertension. So now we see that um, a lot of cardiologists are interested now. So now that it's become largely uh, a vascular disease, now we see a whole bunch of cardiologists uh, really jumping into, into this as well. So it's interesting to see how it's evolved over time. But really when we think of, I always think of that hypertension plus end organ injury, when we say preeclampsia with severe features, all we're really saying is severe features is end organ injury. And you know, the interesting part is why is it different in everybody, right? Like why do some people develop a seizure? Like, you know, my mom experienced that, but she didn't have these other manifestations as far as I know. But some people, they present with HELP syndrome or or maybe they just have proteinuria or they just have the severe blood pressure. So uh, it's very heterogeneous. The one thing we know about preeclampsia, and that's why the definition has to be so broad, 
is because it doesn't fit in one little box. Um, it presents differently in everybody, sometimes laboratory features, sometimes clinical signs and symptoms. And then, you know, the interesting part to me is that a subset of women with preeclampsia develop HELP syndrome, which is a thrombotic microangiopathy disorder. It's driven by microangiopathic hemolysis. So we've often pushed hemolysis to the side, but, uh, you know, I'll kind of point out why uh, hemolysis is a key driver of disease and what that means for potential treatment. So what got me interested was actually as a fellow, I didn't know anything about complement, maybe from as a, as a medical student, but definitely not something we learn in OBGYN residency. And, um, uh, but I was introduced to it during fellowship. Uh, and in, in 2012, we had a case, a 35 year old first pregnancy at 26 weeks, perfectly healthy. She presented with basically classic preeclampsia and HELP syndrome. So uh, she had severe hypertension, proteinuria, hemolysis, liver enzymes were in the 400s, platelet count 84,000, normal creatinine. And just to point out, she did not have atypical HUS because she had no renal failure, but she had basically the classic uh, picture. So the recommendations is really right, either expedite delivery or maybe at the most get 48 hours for steroids, right? Um, and, and when you have HELP syndrome, most people don't even want to wait that 48 hours. So we recommended that I was actually the attendant on call as a fellow, just like our fellows, they take calls attendants and um, uh, recommended delivery. But I said, you know, talk to the neonatal team first. After talking to the neonatal team, she didn't want to be delivered. And um, <clears throat> so she declined delivery. She's 26 weeks and three days. Now we consider that pretty far out. We, you know, is somebody say, is 26 weeks even peri viable? Um, uh, in the US, our, our survival is very good. Now, in other countries, they consider peri viable under 28 weeks. In, in some countries, like I do research in Colombia, they would consider under 28 weeks to be peri viable because mortality is so high. But in the US, 26 weeks, you know, um, we start to feel very confident in our NICU. But this patient said, no, that, you know, I, she's hearing a lot of the, the risks, the complications uh, that can occur at 26 weeks. And she asked if there was any alternative. So I had been working with my, my mentor colleague uh, on uh, developing a sort of compassionate use protocol to treat preeclampsia and HELP syndrome when it's really early onset with, with complement inhibition. So we offered this to her and we told her, well, truthfully, this would be the first case ever, right? Like there was no uh, uh, first case in the world. So it's, it's speculation. Um, but we had, uh, we explained the pathophysiology, which, which I'll explain to you and, and the rationale. Um, and she, so she actually, she agreed to treatment. Her father was a physician and he, um, he heard the story and, and he agreed and they all wanted to do this treatment. So she had, like I said, help syndrome. Um, but you know, she didn't have active symptoms. So, you know, we thought, okay, like we'll give her steroids and then we give her a dose of this complement blocker. Some of you guys are familiar because now we've given it here at Cedar sinai um, But she got this um, drug, Eculizumab, which is a complement blocker. She had um, uh, LDH here is over 400. So she had hemolysis. That actually the hemolysis resolved within a week. Um, and then the platelet count was 84,000. Actually, it went up to 250,000 and it's dosed weekly. So she ended up getting three doses of the drug and basically the HELP syndrome resolved. The key here is it does take about five to six days for the full effect of the drug. So it's not like rapid acting, which, which we've seen here as well. And then also the LFT, so <clears throat> she had uh, elevated liver enzymes in the 400s and those normalized within six, seven days. So you see it's a process, you know, over the course of a couple of days, but basically within, within six, seven days, the HELP syndrome is completely uh, resolved. So she ended up, you know, before the treatment, she was 26 weeks, three days with HELP syndrome. Baby you estimated weight one pound, 15 ounces. And then we gained almost three weeks, 20 days actually in total. And so she, baby was born at 29 weeks and two days, two pounds, 11 ounces. So actually gained almost a pound and did well. Baby did, baby was still in the NICU for two months because 29 weeks is still very early, uh, but didn't have any complications and, and mom recovered very well. So both mom and, and baby did very well. Now, I think I have to age nine now. I think, I think he's age nine. Um, and we still get, still get pictures and, 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 and cards. And, um, it was a really amazing case and really sparked my, uh, interest in it. So then the question is, what did we tell her? Like, what, what did we tell her? What was the rationale? Was it crazy to do? Uh, yeah, many of my colleagues, uh, thought we were crazy <laughs> for sure. I, uh, but you know, it's serious, it's serious business as, as we know, taking care of preoccupation. So we have to be very, very careful of what we do and what we offer to patients. 
And so, you know, what did we tell her about why complement system is involved? The complement system is your immune system. So a lot of people don't realize that this is your immune system, your innate immunity. Now with COVID, we're learning a lot about innate versus adaptive immunity, right? I would say most people are kind of talking about adaptive immunity now that we have antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, vaccines, all of those are designed for adaptive immunity, but innate immunity is your immediate response. So when COVID first came out, and none of us have antibodies yet, um, you need your host immune system to act right away. That's the complement system is very heavily involved in that immediate response to threats. So, and, and there's a lot of them. These aren't cytokines and some confusion. These are not, in, uh, they, this is uh, not, they can trigger release of cytokines, like release of IL-6, but, but they're, it's their own immune system. And there's over a whole collection of over 40 proteins, enzymes, receptors, and they sort of stimulate inflammation and, and attack kind of foreign material. But they can be activated by not just foreign material, but also just DNA, RNA, apoptotic debris, immune complexes. So it's not always from a foreign host. Now, pregnancy um, is a major trigger for activation of complement. So these complement proteins have to be activated. They're kind of quiet until there's some sort of threat, right? So is pregnancy a threat? Well, um, why is pregnancy a, a trigger? Well, there's foreign material, right, from, from the pregnancy. It's at least 50% foreign DNA. And then with surrogacy or donor egg, it could be 100% uh, uh, foreign material. The other things that can trigger complement infections, which I mentioned, COVID is a big trigger of complement, and, and we studied that here at Cedars. Um, but also cancer, transplant, autoimmune disease. So it's not limited to just pregnancy. So I mentioned why pregnancy is a complement amplifying condition. Um, I mean, we probably know as OBGYNs, but not everybody, that the placenta has the same DNA as the baby, right? And not only that, but the placenta is releasing material into the circulation. It undergoes apoptosis, right? And there's these apoptotic blebs that are released into the maternal circulation. And not just that, but the blebs actually sometimes release material. And we know that because we know that there's fetal DNA in the circulation. So there's actually baby's DNA, RNA in the circulation and placental debris. So moms actually can, can react to this material potentially. So, you know, how does that happen? Well, there's these complement proteins. A lot of people know about C3, C4 from lupus, and that's kind of maybe all they know about complement. And those are C3 and C4 are inactive proteins. So they're in, they're always in the circulation. And, and But what happens when you activate the complement pathway, it's almost like activating the coagulation cascade, right? You start going down this cascade, but you can activate the complement pathway and you activate it by having this foreign material uh, like a virus or an immune complex or placental debris. And then you get what's um, the C3B, which is uh, the opsonin. So if you remember now from medical school, that's what kind of tags something and says, you're, you're a foreign material, we need to get rid of you. So you, you tag something with C3B. But then if that goes on, then what happens is you uh, activate C5. So a lot less people know about C5 because we never measure C5. But C5 is, the, is very important because it's the terminal part of the pathway. This generates what's called the membrane attack complex. So you guys may remember from, again, keep going back to medical school, the Big Mac attack, the membrane attack complex will actually, is literally what, what causes cell death, right? It, it forms on the cell membrane, creates pores, causes cell lysis. So it can create a lot of tissue damage, which is good when you want it to attack a virus or bacteria, but it can be harmful when that happens, you know, to yourself, right? More like, almost like autoimmune. So this big MAC attack can actually form on endothelial cells, red blood cells, and placenta trophoblasts. So there's a lot of good data that, that actually it can form on the placenta. So one, just to say, it, well, is this system, you know, really revved up in pregnancy? Is, is that right? And, um, you know, Dr. Romero and, and colleagues, a well-respected researcher, showed that, yes, actually, what they did is just they just measured complement markers in, in normal pregnancy versus uh, non-pregnant. And they see that, actually, the complement system is, is revved up almost twofold in, in normal pregnancy, right? So this is just normal pregnancy. So there is some degree of activation in, in routinely. So, but then that question is, if the system is revved up, what about this C5B9? So C5B9, it forms a transmembrane pore, and, and that's why I call it the Big Mac attack. Like uh, if it's bacteria, virus, it pokes holes, and then eventually you get cell lysis. And, and this might be what it looks like on electron microscopy. 
And interestingly, what if this, the question is, what if this is the placenta? Can, can C5 be the nine poke holes in the placenta? And, and, and it seems like there is some evidence that yes, it, it can. So that's the worry is that what would happen was that this, uh, the C5, I mentioned that C5, it gets activated like, like the coagulation cascade. There's like numerous numbers, right? So, you know, a lot of people are familiar with coagulation cascade, not as familiar with the complement cascade, but one thing leads to another once it, once it gets going. So once you get to C5, then you immediately get C6, C7, C8, C9. It's, it's like automatic. And then it forms this pore. And so this could potentially form a pore on the surface of like a villus trophoblast. <clears throat> so I'm always like a visual learner too. And, uh, and I like to keep things simple as possible because it's a complex topic. But I feel like if it um, can be explained simply, there's obviously more complex, but that maybe you could help understand it. So the thought is that um, you know, that there's semi-allergenic material released from the placenta. This goes on all the time. And this could potentially trigger activation of the complement system. So like I said, that would trigger the cascade. The cascade would just kind of move forward. And then potentially you would get deposition of this uh, big MAC attack on the placenta. And then you would potentially lose the pregnancy, right? If you had enough placental damage. But we know that, that now that is a problem. There's some people have recurrent miscarriage. Uh, or pregnancy placental complications, but most people do well. So <clears throat> there must be mechanisms in place for this not to happen. And that's true. So there are numerous regulators for the complement. I'm gonna focus on the complement system, but there's numerous complement regulators on the surface of the placenta. So they're kind of expressed and they basically um, inhibit complement at different steps. So they're kind of protecting the placenta and saying, it's okay, it's safe, don't attack me. And not only that, so the placenta has these mechanisms, but also in mom's blood. So mom in her blood, she has these complement proteins that are also regulators and they slow down. So, so there's regulators in the bloodstream and on the placental surface. All of these things are basically meant to sort of keep things in balance, right? And to not let things get out of hand and to say, leave the placenta alone, I'm fine, it's okay. So the question that I, uh, started to study, or I've been studying for 10 years, is um, does in preeclampsia help, does the balance shift towards increased complement activation, meaning is there just more, too much, too much, we, my, my mentor used to say too much garbage, right? Because the placenta is producing all this garbage and debris, and the more stress the placenta, the more garbage it releases into the circulation. And is it just too much? It's just too much, the body can't handle it. And, and eventually in some people you get too much deposition of C5B9. Um, or actually, is it that there's some impairment in the complement regulator? So maybe um, everybody has a little bit of increased stimulation of their immune system, but it's people who have an impairment in the ability to regulate the system. So maybe they have a mutation here or a mutation there, and that limits the ability to fight off the complement system. And that seems to be true as well. And we saw that with COVID as well. So, and I'm gonna go into a little bit of the data that we have. So the answer, short answer is a little bit of both. <laughs> uh, I focus more my research on the first, although I'm getting more interested in the, in the latter. So first on, on why we think there's this increased C5B9 I mentioned, uh, this is really our focus, C5B9. You know, if you look back, I was a fellow between 2010, 2013, there's very little data on complement and preeclampsia, but one group, um, in addition to Romero, uh, also at WashU, and WashU is well known for their uh, research in complement, and there's a group with Mike Nelson, and, and, and I think this was his fellow at the time. They looked at C5B9 deposition, and they could see, literally visually see, that it was being deposited um, if they took placentas with preeclampsia versus healthy pregnancies, that actually there was a, a, a twofold increase. Now, at that time, most people believed that complement was an epiphenomenon, meaning, well, there's damage going on. Eventually, you're going to have inflammation. That's not a surprise. Uh, but we'll kind of show you why um, a lot of people are starting to kind of realize that this may be, may be more important. So one is our own uh, Dr. Karamunchi. So many of you know or don't know Anand Karamunchi. And I mentioned nephrologists were really big in preeclampsia and none bigger than Anand Karamunchi who really, um, geez, back in 2000, I was looking at this, 2013 had his major paper showing that SFLT and placental growth factor are very helpful markers for preeclampsia. 2013, 
Did I say that right? No, no, no. Actually, 2003. Sorry, 2003, because it was actually even before I was a resident. So it's been um, 18 years that we figured out, or he figured out, that s -flit and, and is high and PLGF are low in preeclampsia. This is what's called angiogenic imbalance. And, and these kind of particularly s -flit inhibits vascular growth factor. So this is kind of well accepted, right? His work has been cited thousands and thousands of times. And it's basically accepted that, that we see this pattern consistently in preeclampsia. So, you know, what, what's going on? But, you know, the question always was, these factors are released from the placenta. So people say there's factors released from the placenta that cause preeclampsia, but no one knows why they're released. Hypoxia, decreased blood flow, ischemia, like, but, you know, maybe a little bit, but we don't really know what's causing, what's the trigger, right? They don't release themselves. Something has to trigger their release. So one possibility is complement. And, and, and Dr. Karamunchi, along with his fellow Iris Collier, when he was in Boston, um, looked at complement deposition on the placenta. And what they found was as complement deposits on the placenta, you start to build up this s flit in the placenta. And then eventually the uh, s flit is released from the circulation. So this, this was kind of showing potentially that complement activation, complement deposition on the placenta can then trigger release of these anti angio factors into the circulation. And then we know you go down the path of preeclampsia. So what that would look like, again, visual, because I kind of, okay, let, let's show what's going on. Let's say you have complement deposition on the placenta. We know this happens, happens from early pregnancy. And then you have release of this s -flit. This is basically a soluble inhibitor of vascular endothelial growth factor and placental growth factor. So these are two important growth factors, right? There's a lot of attention on placental growth factor, in particular, low levels, right? So s -flit inhibits placental growth factor. Placental growth factor is very important for placental health. As soon as PLGF goes down, you're really high risk for not just preeclampsia, but any kind of placental-mediated complication and growth restriction, of course. But VEGF is also important, when, and so s -flit inhibits both. When you inhibit VEGF, that really has detrimental effects on the kidney. So that's why a lot of people were focused on VEGF inhibition initially, because they saw a lot of kidney damage, and then you see a lot of proteinuria. So you can really clearly link VEGF inhibition to hypertension and proteinuria. But so this is a question, right? And, and so I know Dr. Caramunchi is working on, you know, can we, can we block s -flit? Can we just block it directly? And my, you know, what I'm focused on, can we actually block the complement? If we block the complement, can that actually limit the release of s -flit or at least mitigate it, right? You can't undo the damage, but, but can you mitigate this effect? So that's kind of potential treatments that we're, you know, focused on. So when I was a fellow, you know, and this was a, for any residents or fellows, this is my, I, I didn't know, like I said, I didn't know anything about complement until I was a fellow. And I started this area in 2011 and I've been doing it for over 10 years. And I would say, you know, keep the belief. If you, if you, I, I don't know why I got interested in complement, but um, I, I think once, once you find something you like, stick to it, believe in it. Uh, many people will question it. <laughs> there will be many doubters, especially if you're in a new area, you know, but I, I like new areas and I think, you know, stick to it. And, and you can eventually hopefully make, you know, make, make some progress on it. But so I did this as a fellow and we were looking at C5 B9 in the urine. Well, we looked at different markers, but just to, just to kind of streamline it, we found that this C5 B9, which um, we knew was on the placenta, we also found that it was increased in blood, um, but it was even more so in urine. So the C5 B9, and this is reflecting kidney injury to be clear. When we see C5 B9 in urine, it shouldn't be there. It's larger than albumin, right? Even albumin shouldn't be in the urine, but C5B39 is even larger than albumin. So what we're seeing is that in severe preeclampsia, you have really marked elevation of this marker. And, and if you look at controls, it was undetectable, right? So, so we knew this was something very interesting. And um, also people said, well, maybe complement is a subtype of preeclampsia. Everybody's into different phenotypes of preeclampsia. Maybe there's a complement phenotype, and then maybe there's an angiogenic phenotype. So we wanted to see now, at the time we didn't have Karamunchi's work, but now subsequently he's kind of shown the same thing, like I said, in 2018. But in 2013, we showed that as complement increases in the urine, you also have this increase angiogenic imbalance in the blood. So you had a rise of s and a decrease in PLGF. 
So we could see that these seem to be uh, part of the same disease process. They weren't clearly like, here's one process, here's another. So, um, and now researchers have basically uh, more and more are seeing, seeing the same thing. So, you know, back at the time, um, 2013, 2014, I, I took a job in Oregon uh, out of fellowship. And one of my mentors there, Jorge Telosa, he, um, now he grew up in Colombia, but he practiced OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine in the U.S. But he had uh, developed a whole global network and, 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 and had started to focus mostly on Colombia. And I remember asking him if there's a lot of preeclampsia in Colombia. And, and he said, well, it's probably some of the highest rates in the world. And um, it's the number one cause of maternal mortality. When you look recently, there was a lot of, you know, this this article showing that in the U.S. the leading cause of maternal mortality is homicide, which of course is I mean it's it's unacceptable, right? One um, thing that you notice though is it's partly because our rate of maternal mortality from preeclampsia is very low, so that number is low. In Colombia, the rate of maternal mortality from preeclampsia is twenty-fold higher in Colombia than it is in the U.S. So that's why their number one cause of maternal mortality is preeclampsia because it's 20 fold higher than what we see in the US. So that of course piqued my interest to say, well, let's study it over there. So we developed a series of studies, which we named COPA, Complement in Preeclampsia in the Americas to study complement markers. And we work with groups in Cartagena, Medellin, Bogota, and we've been funded through, through the Colombian um, equivalent of the NIH for now over eight years, knock on wood. And actually, we're going on COPA-5, so we just launched COPA-5 in, in, in Cartagena. And actually, I just got back from COPA-3, so COPA-3, uh, and I um, actually, I was supposed to go in March of 2020, and I remember Dr. Kilpatrick, can't, it, obviously, COVID was coming, and she canceled what she called and said, you cannot go, this COVID, COVID thing looks pretty serious, um, you know, maybe you should cancel your trip. And so I canceled it the day before. And turned out to be true. COVID, unfortunately, as we know, was, was pretty bad. And um, so I finally got back, you know, a year and a half later. And this is um, Jaime Luis Silva. He's um, He um, helped basically get funding for this study and uh, through his university in Bogota. And he's actually the chair of his department. And I laugh um, that I'm making the chair of the department uh, sort of pipette research samples here uh, in the lab. So we actually use a lab. So I run, I learned to do ELISA assays. That's what I did in fellowship, you know, to measure protein concentrations and samples. And we had blood and urine and spinal fluid. So, and and uh, this lab lets us use their huge gigantic machine that they have here. And, um, and we run assays over there. So we just completed COPA-3. And so that's been kind of a really, uh, you know, exciting venture that we've, that we've done. So our first result from that was COPA-1, uh, which we started, you know, probably in 2015, 2016, and we published in 2019, showing, basically, uh, <clears throat> we wanted to show the same thing, that the complement is increased in pre in a larger cohort, a more, um, a, a new population, more, more uh, different phenotypes of disease. The amazing part is that first study was in Boston, and then now this is in basically uh, Cartagena, Bogota, Medellin. We saw the exact same results that um, that this urinary marker in particular, that when we looked at urinary C5B-9, you were 20-fold more likely to have severe disease. <clears throat> and this was doing ROC analysis. And um, so we've been wanting to make a point of care test, and I think some people are, are working on that. You know, but that was kind of the thought, that we had this threshold level above which that you could basically confirm that you have complement-mediated disease and that you might be a candidate for targeted complement inhibition. So, so that was our goal, really kind of thinking of it as a point of care test. So I think we kind of showed that complement is increased uh, in preeclampsia, but is there impaired regulation? And actually this was COPA-2. One of the goals of COPA-2 was to look at a, a regulatory marker. So this is Jesus Velasquez, he works at a, at a Medellin, and basically what we do is uh, their, their um, local investigators are, are, they're the lead PI on the study, right? So, and we do everything in Colombia. So we don't just, uh, uh, you know, take the samples and run. We, we, we kind of do it uh, together and they lead the study. And then they, they presented, it, like Dr. Velasquez presented it as oral presentation at SMFM. And, um, and then he was first author on, on the manuscript. So really, and this is amazing for, 
you know, some of these groups um, who are not typically publishing, um, you know, uh, scientific research. So he wanted to look at this CD59. So CD59, if you remember, was one of the protective factors and CD59 protects the placenta against and, and other cells from complement attack. But our thought was, and or Dr. Velasquez had this idea that maybe CD59 is released and so um, you lose your protective mechanism. Um, and I think he was right that we show, and we showed that he was right, that actually if you go from healthy to, to chronic hypertension to severe preeclampsia, the amount of CD59 in the blood increases because it should be membrane bound, but then it's released into the blood. So we showed that basically the degree of, of CD59 in the blood increased with disease severity. And it was amazing, he, he published in Pregnancy Hypertension and, and when they sent back the article, zero revisions, zero revisions. So that's like the miracle like that almost never happened. So really impressive that um, I, you know, I told him to get his uh, paper published without any any uh, edits or revisions in that journal was was fantastic. So you know others have shown also I mentioned that that this genetics and and um, I've been interested more and more interested in genetics because um, we know that there's genetic th these these proteins do have genetic mutations and obviously we're knowing lo more and more about genetic variants in in you know a variety of diseases. So back in 2011, a group from New York showed that actually some of these proteins have mutations and they don't work as well. And when they don't work as well, you get more preeclampsia and more help syndrome. So we've known that now 10 years, right? Um, and then a group at Johns Hopkins, um, one of my um, uh, sort of mute now friends, because he's interested in this area, Jason Vaught, uh, really bright MFM at Hopkins, he did an expanded um, analysis of complement genes. And um, he found that um, similar to this group in New York, that yeah, there are a lot of complement mutations, but these panels are, are, are growing. And so he was able to, able to identify even more mutations that weren't discovered before. So one, for example, in HELP syndrome, he found that 20% of patients with HELP syndrome had this big deletion in this one uh, gene that um, really was important in regulation of the terminal pathway, 20% versus 2% in the general population. So that's fascinating, right? So we started offering complement genetic testing here at Cedar sinai and um, for clinical use, clinical counseling. And so one, this is one of the first patients I tested. She's 31, first pregnancy, 35 weeks she was induced for severe preeclampsia and it progressed to HELP syndrome. She had a really difficult course, postpartum hemorrhage, transfusion, DIC, right? She's in the ICU, really traumatic. And um, so she saw me for preconception consultation and said she was really nervous about having another pregnancy after what she went through. And, you know, I offered this genetic testing because I said, well, there's some data that maybe there's a genetic link and maybe this might say help guide her if she's predisposed or not. So interestingly enough, we found this exact same deletion that, that they had seen at Johns Hopkins, which they had seen in one in five patients with HELP syndrome. And the very first patient that I tested, I found this homozygous deletion. Like I said, it's about 2% in the general, po general population. And we know that this is associated with, it's, a path, it's considered a pathogenic finding, meaning we know it has a pathogenic effect. So she decided to do surrogacy. Now, I don't know if that's right or not, but... Um, she used that information. We told her what's available in the literature and she was already kind of leaning that way. And then, and then that helped guide her decision. So the question is though, if preeclampsia and help syndrome are characterized by this increased complement activation and impaired regulation, well, now it's starting to sound a lot like atypical HUS, because that's exactly what happens in atypical HUS. In atypical HUS, you have increased complement activation, impaired complement regulation, we know there's complement gene mutations, the same type of mutations that we see in HELP syndrome. And we know that atypical HUS is a thrombotic microangiopathy disorder, exactly like HELP syndrome. So it gets, so we used to think atypical HUS is this rare disorder and um, it's complement mediated. And that's what differentiates it. Preeclampsia HELP syndrome is not complement mediated, atypical HUS is, but now the new thinking is well, maybe they're so similar because they have the same pathophysiology. And I think most people are starting to really agree with that. 
So why is that? Partly we think of this thrombotic microangiopathy, TMA. So I, I do give a lot of talks on atypical HUS, and people are not very familiar with it at all because it is pretty rare. But And, and OBGYNs, we don't use this term TMA. TMA is, is used more by hematologists, nephrologists. So what is a TMA? Because I told you, HELP syndrome is, by definition, a TMA. A TMA is a disorder characterized by endothelial injury, microvascular thrombosis, and it predisposes to microangiopathic pathocomosis, thrombocytopenia, and organ injury. So that sounds exactly like preeclampsia turning into HELP syndrome, right? So you see endothelial activation, endothelial injury, sort of end organ injury, you get obstruction of blood flow, and then you get shearing of red blood cells, and you get schistocytes, right, hemolysis. So there's no doubt that this process happens in HELP syndrome. There's no doubt that this process happens in atypical HUS. The question is, what causes it? And is the cause the same in both disorders? So we know in atypical HUS, this process is mediated by complement. We get complement mutations, some of the same ones I just told you about that we've been seeing. And importantly, you see increased c 5 b 9 deposition on endothelial cells. For atypical HUS, it's endothelial cells rather than the placenta, right? And particularly in the kidney, the kidney has a lot of endothelium and also doesn't regulate complement very well. So with atypical HUS, you see c 5 b 9 deposition on endothelial cells. <clears throat> Interestingly, people who have looked at this in preeclampsia we see this exact same thing. So there's no doubt that in preeclampsia, you also have not just deposition on the placenta, but deposition on the endothelium. And then you get hemolysis and thrombocytopenia. So, um, but that's atypical HUS. Now, the interesting part with atypical HUS is it usually, like over half the time, progresses to renal failure. The main way to differentiate atypical HUS and HELP syndrome is renal failure. Atypical HUS is like florid renal failure, right? Dialysis potential for renal transplant. Um, the key with atypical HUS, it's usually followed by a trigger. And one of the major triggers is pregnancy. Why? Because I just said pregnancy is a complement amplifying condition. Atypical HUS, you're predisposed. So most cases actually occur immediately postpartum. 95% of cases occur immediately in the postpartum. And that's exactly what we've seen here at Cedar sinai right? We've, we've had at least seven cases that I can remember. And it's all immediately by day two, day three, you're on dialysis. And that's almost a hallmark feature of atypical HUS. The, the wonderful thing about atypical HUS is there's a really great treatment, complement inhibition. Before that, there was no treatment, right? This is FDA approved treatment. Um, there was no treatment. Blood transfusion, supportive care, plasma exchange didn't really work. Blood transfusions, don't steroids don't really work. Same thing with help, right? Plasma exchange doesn't work. Steroids don't really work. Um, well, once they started treating atypical HUS with complement blockade, patients started getting better, which we've seen here at Cedars as well, right? They come off dialysis, they don't get renal transplant, their kidneys recover, and their hemolysis goes away. Amazing, right? So, you know, that's a question, um, can that happen in HELP syndrome too? You know, I, uh, our prior fellows, you know, we, we've been trying to hammer away at this, you know, uh, progress is slow, but, you know, eventually you do make some progress over time. So Mega Gupta, some of you remember a former fellow, Shravya Govinda Pagari, they looked at pregnancy associated atypical HUS. They all look the same in the literature when you actually go into the literature, but why are people unfamiliar? It's just, it's true. One, they're, they're missing the diagnosis. Two, it is uncommon, right? How many people go on dialysis postpartum? We might have one or two a year. So it's not very common. But the other reason that people miss the diagnosis is because it tends to follow a pregnancy complication, preeclampsia, postpartum hemorrhage, IUFD, miscarriage, right? And, and then you develop renal failure. And what happens in OBGYN, we get tunnel vision, right? We blame everything on the condition, right? So if you have preeclampsia, everything that happens going forward is due to preeclampsia, even if it's three months from now, right? Um, uh, if you have postpartum hemorrhage, everything is due to the postpartum hemorrhage. Now, the exception is DVT-PE, right? If you had preeclampsia, and then you had a C-section, and then you had a postpartum hemorrhage, and you were in the ICU, and you developed a pulmonary embolism, nobody would be surprised, right? Because you say, yeah, they had so many risk factors that it was provoked, right? Atypical HUS is the same way. It's your immune system is pushed and pushed and pushed, and it's provoked, right? So you have preeclampsia, you have a C-section, you have a hemorrhage, you're in the ICU, boom, now you have kidney failure, right? You Because 
your immune system, we know about the coagulation system. We know the coagulation system is pushed to the limit, but what happens when the immune system is pushed to the limit? And we saw that was COVID, right? When you flood the body with virus, what happens? The complement system, what we saw, right? Attacks the lung and you get profound uh, inflammation and injury in the lung until you need lung transplant. And then that's what we see and in a small number of cases, right? And what we see with atypical HOS is you attack the kidney, you attack the kidney until you need renal transplant. So you see complement, once it gets going, it doesn't stop, right? And, and so we had some luck inhibiting complement in COVID with the idea of kind of mitigating the inflammatory response. Now it's important, some people say, well, can't we just wait and see? So someone's postpartum, they get renal failure, they're on dialysis. Most of the time the nephrologists say, can't we just give it two to three months? Let's see what happens. It'll probably get better. Well, they're right, 50% of the time the patient will get better, but 50% they won't. And you just don't know which group that is. So if you don't give complement blockade, let's just say you wait, you give dialysis. Dialysis is not really a treatment, right? It's a temporizing measure. One in four will go into renal failure, dialysis, or death, one in four. But if you give complement blockade and you recognize the disease, it's closer to zero. It's not zero, but uh, this is some publication bias, but it's very, very low. So if you wait, it may be too late, right? I always say, right, um, if someone has a heart attack, you treat right away. If they have a blood clot to the lung, you treat right away. If they have a blood clot in the brain, like a stroke, you treat right away. If you, and, and TMA is a blood clot to the kidney, right? It's a thrombosis in the kidney. Why don't people treat right away? But people don't, they wait. So I would say that thrombosis to the kidney is an emergency as well. And that's why you have to treat really quickly. And actually when you treat quickly, like we do, you get really quick recovery. And some people say, well, they recovered so quickly, they must not have had the disease. No, it's just that if you treat it um, expeditiously, that um, you can have actually very good responses. So, so that's kind of the interesting part about it. So they're very similar, right? Atypical HOS is microangiopathic hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, kidney injury. Help is microangiopathic hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, liver injury. That's just how they were defined, right? There's a lot of overlap between the two, but that's why they're so similar. And they have a lot of the same systemic manifestations, hypertension, proteinuria, seizures. So we wanted to look at this because people keep asking, well, how do I tell them apart? And I keep saying renal failure, renal failure, but a lot of people wanted a little bit more objective data. And so we published this in hypertension just in September to say, what is the difference between HELP and HUS? And what biomarkers, not even biomarker, well, I, I still view creatinine and LDH as a biomarker. It's just they're they're cheap and easy to do, right? And actually they're very effective biomarkers. You don't people want fancy biomarkers, but actually LDH and creatinine are very helpful. So when you look at pregnancy associated atypical HOS, the creatinine tends to be very high, um, average over five. Help syndrome, the creatinine doesn't go that high, right? That's my experience that the creatinine, it's very unusual. There's a mild AKI, it's self-limited, resolves within 72 hours. HUS, it gets worse postpartum and it just escalates. And then the hemolysis. So this is why I like checking LDH in everybody. People say, well, what am I gonna do with LDH, right? Well, one, you're gonna know if there's hemolysis. That's gonna tell you why the patient's blood count is going down. Patients with hemolysis are much more likely to end up in the ICU, much more likely to need blood products, right? Much more likely to have pulmonary edema. So if you have hemolysis, you're gonna be a little sicker and you don't know unless you check. So, and the other thing is if you check LDH, HELP syndrome, it's usually very modestly elevated. You know, Sabayu is 600, that's way too high, right? Most patients don't even get to 600. Most patients are in the range of 300 to 400, right? We've seen that over and over and over again, right? So 600 is too, too strict of a diagnosis. Um, but with atypical HUS, it shoots right past 600. It's like high. And many times it's it's you can't even measure it because it's too high. So if you check an LDH and it says above the upper limit of normal, that's a red flag that you have some real serious hemolysis and you may have a case of atopic HUS. So, and especially the combination. So we came up with this combination. If you have an L, uh, creatinine over 1.9 and LDH over 600, that's 95% most likely going to be atypical HUS, especially if you're more than 72 hours postpartum, right? Because if you're three days out from delivery and you still have hemolysis and you still have renal failure, I think that that's not HELP syndrome. And I think that's not preeclampsia, right? 
what happened is now you've provoked the complement cascade and you've morphed into atypically 2S and your kidneys may not recover. So those are patients that need to be treated. Let me give you an example. We had a number of cases at Cedars and this is one. I'm gonna give you the most straightforward example because you know, maybe I don't wanna create any debate. So 42 year old um, lady with recurrent pregnancy loss. She comes to the emergency room 10 days after an eight week miscarriage. Now she had an eight week miscarriage, right? So she can't have preeclampsia, she can't have help syndrome um, and she had no hemorrhage, uncomplicated miscarriage. Um, and she was healthy. She was a yoga instructor, very healthy. So she comes into the emergency room 10 days after this miscarriage. Actually, her labs look okay at that time, but she's starting to have some symptoms, nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath. She was sent home and she came back three days later. The symptoms were a little bit worse. And now look what happened to the labs. Now this is literally in three days, her creatinine goes from 1.1 to 11. Her LDH too high to measure, over 5,600. Platelets, 28,000. LFTs, 200s. Now, if she had had a full-term pregnancy, I guarantee you she would have been diagnosed with HELP syndrome, right? But she had an eight-week miscarriage and it's been two weeks, right? So this is right away, people go, well, how do you know it's atypical HUS? There's almost nothing else that this could be. I mean, this is almost a slam dunk right there, right off the bat, you know what the diagnosis is. Um, there's very few things that would cause that picture. So, you know, you saw her labs. Now, what happens in reality is that people give dialysis and plasma exchange. Um, dialysis, you need to do for two things, volume overload, electrolyte abnormalities, right? But keep in mind, dialysis does not treat the disease. It's like a filter, right? Even if I say it's like a filter, um, it's not treating anything. Uh, it's a temporizing measure. Plasma exchange, ineffective for atypical HUS, ineffective for health syndrome, ineffective for atypical HUS. Plasma exchange is only good for TTP because TTP is due to autoantibodies and plasma exchange is good for removing autoantibodies. But this is not an antibody mediated disease. And that's why plasma exchange steroids are ineffective for atypical HUS. Really, you have to treat the underlying disease, which is the complement pathway. So this patient got dialysis plasma exchange. Actually, after a week, they finally gave up and they realized that she needed complement inhibition. Um, and this was actually in our hospital and they started treatment. Um, within three weeks, they stopped dialysis. So her creatinine was 11, right? But off dialysis because she got the appropriate treatment, right? And her creatinine went from 11 to 2.1. The hemolysis went away. The platelets went from 28 to 310,000. And uh, after eight weeks, she even stopped the therapy. So you don't need it forever. And I always, that's why I always compare to DVT-PE. When you have a DVT-PE that's provoked, what do we do? It was a provoked, there was a provoking event. So we treat short term, and then you see how the patient does off treatment. This is this exact same approach. You treat for two to three months, they get better, and then you see how they do off treatment. And we've had very good success, and people are starting to realize that this is a very good way to do it. And actually, I saw her a year later for preconception consult. Um, all her lab tests were normal. She was off all treatment, um, but she decided to do surrogacy as well. And I think that I think that actually was a good idea in, in, in her case. So, you know, the question is, um, can we apply this to preeclampsia and HELP syndrome? Well, we did, right? And, we, and that was our proof of concept, right? That was in 2012, we published in 2013. So why has it taken so long? Well, we know from COVID, right? Pharmaceutical companies do not want to do research in pregnant women, do not, right? Zero, full stop, zero desire. And that's my experience, right? Um, the pharmaceutical company said, yes, this is interesting, but we have no desire to do it. Good luck, <laughs> you know, go on with your life, right? So luckily people kept publishing, kept publishing in this area. And it took a long time before the company finally said, you know what, <laughs> you know, I, I think we could do this. Um, uh, so, and partly they can do it because the drug has a proven safety record, but we know pharmaceutical companies don't even wanna do studies with drugs that have proven safety in pregnancy, right? Um, but but this drug, it actually, it's a monoclonal antibody, right? Um, and it's a monoclonal antibody against complement, and it, it prevents that, it prevents formation of the membrane attack complex. Now, most monoclonal antibodies cross the placenta, but this one has a hinge because um, they wanted it to evade the immune system. So it has a hinge at the FC receptor. The FC receptor is what transports 
uh, the FC, we'll call it the, the, the neonatal FC receptor. That's what, that, that's what transports antibodies across the placenta. So this can't bind, it, and, and actually, so it can't really cross the placenta, and it's never been detected in breast milk. And now we have New England Journal data from other conditions that we have very good safety data. So it's one of the safer drugs, um, one of the drugs that, that we have good data for. So, you know, we looked in this case, when we go back and we looked at that case that we treated, what we found is as we treat this, so I said that this drug blocks formation of the membrane attack complex. And that's exactly what we saw. As she got better, the c 5 b 9 in the blood was high and it came down with treatment. The c 5 b 9 was high in the urine, it came down with treatment. So these markers may be good to say who has complement mediated disease, and then you can also follow response to treatment. So those are two areas I think that we're most interested in. You know, so we launched, hopefully this helps a lot of you guys understand the CRUSH trial, um, the complement regulation to undo systemic harm in preeclampsia. Now, like I said, I named, we named this trial in 2012, we designed it in 2012. Um, but it wasn't funded until a couple years ago, and then it's a long process, right, to, to get trial clinical trials going and FDA approval. But, but as you see, we opened the trial at Cedar sinai uh, We've enrolled patients already. We're going to enroll 12 patients. Basically, people ask me, what is, what is the criteria? Early onset preeclampsia before 30 weeks. That's what the FDA wanted. FDA said um, under 30 weeks, there's strong rationale to prolong pregnancy because the goal of treatment is to prolong pregnancy. Um, and there's, you know, other things we don't want them to have um, uh, immune disorders or um, immune deficiency, cancer, you know, so we have a long list of things. So the ideal patient might be someone who obviously is otherwise healthy, who comes in basically with preeclampsia at 28, 29 weeks, and who is interested in um, attempting to prolong pregnancy. Um, so that's a trial. We're going to try to, like I said, try to enroll 12 patients in this study, and it's open. So if any of you keep an eye out, please notify me. All of our fellows are co-investigators. Um, you can notify them as well if you think there's someone that might meet this criteria. So I want to leave some time for questions, um, but I just to point out some future directions that genetics are really interested in. At the American Society for Nephrology this year, we showed you know, we've, we've screened about 15 patients with HELP syndrome and actually 90, 93%, 14 out of 15 patients that we've tested um, have genetic, complement genetic variants. So what we have to find out is, are these variants clinically meaningful? So I have a grant with a group in WashU to actually investigate some of these variants and their clinical significance. So that's one of the next step. Can we use this to sort of uh, provide better counseling to patients? And then, um, uh, actually, we're presenting this at SMFM this year. It's kind of expanded on the biomarkers, but, um, uh, you know, now that we have more and more markers, is there a profile that we see? Like, is there a more specific complement profile? c 5 b 9 is good, but we're finding that there's others that you can piece together. And, and we see a couple here that actually this is kind of increasing disease severity. There tends to be like a dose response effect. So, um, you know, and it's hard biomarkers, you don't often see a dose response effect in preeclampsia. So th these are kind of part of the future directions that that we're interested in. But I want to leave some time for questions. Um, you know, the key is complements involved in, in, in normal pregnancy. It's just heightened and dysregulated in preeclampsia and help. It may, you know, look into atypical HUS, very similar. We have a lot of data. Atypical just is leading the way on complement, on genetics, on thrombotic microangiopathy. A lot of this data can apply to preeclampsia and HELP syndrome, but they are different. They are different because you usually don't have renal failure in preeclampsia. Um, so hopefully we'll see. We'll see how this um, if this treatment work treatment works, or maybe we have to try to modify it in some way. But I'm very hopeful that you know targeting the complement pathway is is you know a potential area uh to target in in, in preeclampsia and I've had a lot of help along the way cedars of course cedar sinai ohsu numerous groups in columbia funding agencies in columbia the preeclampsia foundation and and really a large group of, of of us working kind of together so oh five minutes perfect so i think five minutes if you guys have any any questions for me
Answer them all. <laughs> Nice job, Richard. Um, thank you, thank you. So now hopefully you guys are a little bit more familiar. Um, I know. Um, Richard, barring the uh, answer sorry. being uh, all of them, when do we start the more of the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia workup um, for your sort of standard, you know, differentiating them from your standard postpartum or antepartum preeclampsia? Yeah. You know, it all hinges on LDH, and that's why I start checking the LDH before delivery, ideally, or or if if maybe they, you know, obviously whenever it develops, whenever there's concern for for preeclampsia or help, if you're checking LFTs and creatinine, you should be checking LDH, right? And it gives you a clue; it really does. And what we've seen, and what the residents have seen, and, and fellow, right, is that when you have high LDH, and and you have these hemoglobin drops, we have right, like we have numerous people with hemoglobin drops postpartum. That are out of proportion to normal, and then we check, and they have LDH. So that explains turnover, right? Not that you have to do anything different, but explains why the red cells are turning over because they're being hemolyzed, right? So it, it can help guide you. And then if you see that it's really high, then then you do the workup. So I didn't even say the workup would be haptoglobin, peripheral smear, right? You start looking for cystocytes. You start seeing is this red cell hemolysis? Um, and you start tracking it. So uh, I think just like you're tracking platelets, creatinine, LFTs, you should be kind of monitoring, you know, that at the same time. Oh, someone asked, let me pull this chat. Um, oh, right, I'm going to stop the chat so I can see this. Yeah, um, this is Kim. Great job, Richard. Quick question on the lady, the eight-week miscarriage lady you got. Mm -hmm on your timeline, mm -hmm. did was she starting to improve on the dialysis or she didn't get any improvement until you started the medication? The key is with dialysis is, um, it does help a little bit, right, bring down, um, but what you see is it's temporary, particularly with the creatinine, that, you know, you get these, whenever you start doing dialysis, you get these creatinine values and they're not very accurate because there's so much fluctuation. But the key is it seems that, no, the kidneys don't get better um, you sometimes get some improvement in the LDH, the platelet count, um, but in the vast majority, the kidneys do not get better. And, and um, so they do have some improvement because they're so sick, right? I mean, their potassium's going high, their pulmonary edema. So they get better because you resolve the fluid overload by taking fluid off and by restoring the electrolytes, but the, the kidney damage persists. And the cases that we've had postpartum We've had cases where the nephrologists um, put patients on dialysis and then they want to send them home on dialysis. And I've had to fight back and I said, you are not sending our patient home on dialysis. You are not because there's no reason. There's no reason. She didn't come in on dialysis. I'm not sending her home on dialysis. And so we've given compliment blockade and they come off and they get better. And then the nephrologists are sometimes surprised like, oh, okay. Like, you know, so it, it does make a big difference because dialysis is a filter it's not really treating any any kind of underlying disease. I saw another question real quick. Do these findings occur in any of the collagen vascular diseases? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, but complement is everywhere. So I'm biased. But they say people who study complement, complement is everywhere. It's your immune system. It's involved in autoimmune disease. People are studying it in lupus nephritis. People are studying it in autoimmune disease, antiphospholipid syndrome, um, and and I think there probably is, <laughs> probably is. Actually, so now um, there's a new drug, a C5A inhibitor that was approved for Anca vasculitis. So for Anca vasculitis, um, that was the first FDA approved C5A inhibitor. So we're starting to see a, a real rapid increase in complement uh, therapeutics for different diseases. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I'm going to close. Have a good day.